Lord, give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Suzanne and Tammy. Praise the Lord. It's not easy doing this without music, I know. I've been in a karaoke bar before. But... <laughs> they wouldn't let me back once they heard me sing. Praise the Lord. But, but it is difficult, but I appreciate it. And the Spirit of the Lord is wherever we are. Amen. And uh, we can worship Him in spirit and truth in any way we're capable of. Amen. God says it's good. Praise God. Amen. A lot of people miss it. I asked Mike this morning if I missed a memo or something. Or maybe the time change had taken place and I wasn't aware of it. But I don't know where everybody is. But praise the Lord. Well, I do. As a matter of fact, I do know where they are. Some are in Florida. Some are, yeah, I mean, they're all over the place. You don't really want to know all that, so I'm not going to tell you. Praise God. God is good. Amen. And wherever two or more are gathered together in His name, there He is in the midst of Amen of us. Praise the Lord. So God is always here in spite of uh, the numbers of uh, people missing. Praise the Lord. You ever wonder uh, why Peter Pan is always flying? He never lands. Never lands. I love that joke because it never grows old. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, everybody needs deliverance. Amen. Everybody's got issues. Everybody's got stuff, right? Praise the Lord. Anybody need an ark? I know a guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. Here's for you science freaks. What did the cell say to his sister? Cell, C-E-L-L. -L. What did the cell say to his sister when she stepped on his foot? Thank you. Cell. Sister. Stepped on his foot. He said, mitosis. Mitosis. <laughs> uh, that's the nuclear division of cells, you know, for you. Mitosis. Okay, well, praise the Lord. Maybe I can get you with me this way. Praise the Lord. So we're going to go to the Word of God. I appreciate your patience and your long-suffering. and No one raising pitchforks or torches coming at me after those three horrible months. How many of you know that uh, the 18th, which is Tuesday, is Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement or the Day of the Lord? It's the one day when the high priest is, you know, in, in uh, the Jewish faith, uh, is able to go into the Holy of Holies where the presence of the Lord was, where the Ark of the Covenant was. So he'd take the blood from the sacrifice out in the holy uh, area out where the uh, altar was, and he'd bring it in and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And then God would, and there's a lot involved in it. We'll get into it a little bit this morning, but uh, ultimately the, the idea was that, that once a year God would roll back or cover the sins of Israel for another year until the ultimate day of atonement or the ultimate day of the Lord would come, which was Christ. Amen? And so my hope, my point is this morning, and I hope you understand this, this thing is all about Jesus not about a religion. It's not about rules and regulations. It's not about stuff you're supposed to do. It's about somebody to believe in. Yes. He is the whole thing. He is the revelation that this Bible is trying to give to us. And if we get that, once we really understand that, then we can walk in the truths, the spiritual truths. Uh, the moment you make it about you, you know, what you're going to do and how much you're going to do it and how well you're going to do it, you're setting yourself up for failure exactly. and uh, disappointment and discouragement. And uh, you, can't, you can't have confidence in God if you don't know what God's really all about. Amen? So nothing's impossible with God. You say, well, yeah, Nathan, but you don't know. I got this thing. I, I got this thing. Listen, I, it's not that I'm not sympathetic. It's just that it doesn't matter. Whatever the thing is, God's bigger than that thing. 
Amen. Whether it's relationships. Because I've had all the junk that anybody can have. Pretty much all of it. I'm not going to give you the list of it, but amen. I remember John telling a guy one time, we were doing some remodeling in here right after we bought, shortly after we had bought the church. Most of the remodeling was done, but we were putting in these can lights because there were these horrid, gothic, kind of hideous chandeliers that were hanging. It just made me really uncomfortable every time I was in here. I don't know why, but for whatever reason, I just couldn't deal with it. But, so anyway, we, we changed out of these lights. And, uh, one of the, and at that time, there were a lot of people from the UPC that were coming to this church, right. quite a few. And uh, if you're not familiar with the UPC, it's a denomination that I was licensed uh, and ordained in the ministry there. It's a Pentecostal, uh, highly religious, uh, you know, works oriented kind of thing. Great, you know, it's a great bunch of people, some great revelation that I received uh, from the Lord in that organization, but it just, anyway, I decided to change partners, praise God. But John was talking to some some of the guys that were helping us out doing this, and, uh, and several of them were from the UPC, and they said, well, uh, to John, they said, uh, well, does he have any standards? Standards meaning they used to be, you know, the women had to wear dresses. They never cut their hair. Uh, the guys basically got to do anything they wanted to except grow beards. Yes. Just kidding. Uh, but the standards were far more right. gender kind of specific and more on the women than they were on the guys. But nevertheless, um, they asked John, he said, does, does uh, Nathan have any standards? And he said, standards? He barely has any morals. <laughs> Part of my support team here, praise the Lord. Which I got a big kick out of it. I thought it was hilarious, you know. Because <laughs> they were so concerned, and that just really kind of messed up their whole scheme. But, and as you might notice, none of them are here now. <laughs> Where they went, I don't know. Well, I do have morals. Flawed, but I do have them, praise the Lord. But I don't have standards. Jesus is the standard. Amen. He, he kept it all. He did it all. And all I got to do is just trust in his finished work. Amen. And makes life a whole lot better. Praise the Lord. So anyway, September 18th, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. Uh, and the Day of Atonement, let, let's, let's just look at some scriptures here. John chapter 5, uh, verse 39 through 47. I've got quite a bit here today, so I may go really fast, or I may just stop somewhere. If you get, are really bored, I'll quit. Uh, John chapter 5, verse 39 through 47. But it's, the, the point is, and everything I'm trying to do, that this is always, always about Jesus. And anything else that we think it may be about, it's only because we're not understanding what it is he's trying to tell us that it's about him. And the moment we make it about something other than him, that's the time when we start getting into issues and troubles and, and arguments and just, you know, uh, the inability to accept one another and so on, the denominational kind of things. If you don't believe exactly the way I believe, therefore we can't be friends or therefore we can't, you know, uh, fellowship or anything else. That's all bogus. If we really, all of us understood this is all just about Jesus and we all of our little differences and secular and... and uh, denominational and so forth would go away. Yes. We just wouldn't make them the priority. If you want one, if you want that, fine. I mean, I had a woman get really upset with me about not getting mad at some women who cut their hair. This is early on when I had left the other organization. And uh, I said, well, why would I get angry with them for cutting their hair? It's their hair. Yes. Right? Yeah. Should I be mad at you because you got long hair? No, oh, that's, your, that's your choice. That's between you and God or just between you and your husband or your own mirror. You know, I mean, whatever it is, it's, that's your business. But I'm just saying that's how crazy it can get to where, you know, people want to just start picking around and pointing at this and pointing at that. And it goes much deeper than that. That's just a superficial kind of thing. But if it's telling me something, if you're worried about how long that person's hair is, you, you've got some problems that really ought to be addressed probably instead of her hair. Right? Amen. So anyway, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. 
and you will not come to me that you might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. Now remember, this is, this is uh, John, or Jesus is speaking to people, and John is the one that's the writer of this, but he's talking about, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, these Jewish people that he's preaching to, which was the most part, that, uh, for the most part, who Jesus did preach to, um, they're not accepting him for who he really is. They're not, they're not spiritual people. They're religious people, highly religious people. But they're not spiritual because they cannot have the Spirit of God. So everything they do, they do basically in the flesh. They do it because it's a rule, because it's a, an obligation, a regulation, or what have you. So Jesus said, I come in my Father's name, and you won't receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Yes. How can you believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God? Yes. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. And so what he's saying is, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. Right? right? There's already something here to condemn you. You don't need me to condemn you. The law condemns you. Because right. you can't keep it. Right. That's why you need me. Right? right? So if you don't believe, but you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? In other words... They're reading this, the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, and any other scripture they may have had, the Psalms and what have you, they're reading it not through, with spiritual eyes. They're not seeing the spiritual significance of what God is trying to get across to them. They're constantly looking for another rule. They're always looking for another thing that they have to do, right? And Jesus said, you don't understand these writings because if you did... You would believe me. You would know that I am here. Amen. And you don't believe Moses' writings because you don't understand Moses' writings. You only understand the rules that come from Moses' writings. You don't understand the real purpose for the law or the understanding of what God wants to do with the law. Because, how, because of that, how can you believe my words? I am, I am the personification of all those words. And if you don't believe those words, there's no way you're going to believe me. If you don't understand those words, in other words, there's no way you're going to be able to comprehend me. All right? Go to uh, chapter 7 now, still John. John chapter 7, and we'll read verses 37 through 53. This is kind of a long introduction here, but it's because I'm going to probably confuse you completely. Only because Sally asked me, have you got a message? And I said, well, I've got some stuff. <laughs> but I don't know if it makes any sense to me, so I can't promise it will make a whole lot of sense to you. I'm trusting the Holy Ghost, yes. okay? Amen. So here he says, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Before I go on, let me just ask you, when you read this stuff, do you literally believe that out of your belly is going to come a, you know, it's going to be like a fire hose? No. No, there's, there's symbolism going on here. There's exactly. spiritual language, right? And everything that the Bible is about is that. Yes. In other words, it's all written that way. It's symbolic. Right? Metaphors. Parables. Right. It's not literal. It has a literal meaning, but the words that are being used are spiritual. Sure. They're speaking to the yes. Spirit, which is why the Hebrews could not understand it. Because these are spiritual words. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they're life. Well, if you don't have the Spirit, it's going to have a, you're going to have a tough time understanding it. Or even if you have the Spirit and you want to receive it all intellectually, you're going to have problems with it. Exactly. Because your intellect is going to tell you certain things you need to do where the Spirit is telling you it's already done. And you live from that finished work. Amen. Amen. But this spake, spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Now, here the argument starts. Is your Jesus from Des Moines, or is he from Dallas? You know, where are you going? So, hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? 
So there was a division among the people because of him. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? And the officers answered, Never a man spake this way. In other words, why didn't you arrest him? Why didn't you bust him? And they said, Because we never heard anybody talk like this. Then answered him, them the Pharisees, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? Now remember, these are the people Jesus is talking to, and he's telling them, You don't even believe the Scriptures because they're the ones that are testifying of me. And if you really believe those, then you would know who I am. Now they're, making, they're continuing to argue that this is not anybody. This is just some fluke. This is just some weirdo that's trying to mess with our religion. This people who knoweth not the law are cursed. These are the rabbinic leaders, the, the priests and so forth, who are saying the reason these, these people are following him is because they don't know the law. If they knew the law, they'd know that this guy, he came from Galilee. And uh, no, no Messiah is coming from Galilee, right? So we know the truth, and these are just idiots that don't know anything, right? And Nicodemus, this is the guy... Under them, he that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, remember, he's the one that came and said, what's going on here? He, had, he believed in him, but he didn't want to admit to it. Doth our law judge any man? He's, this is what he's saying to these other Pharisees and these other rabbis. Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? So he's making an argument for Jesus. At least give the guy a chance to express himself before we jump to a conclusion here. And they answered and said unto him, are thou also of Galilee? Or in other words, are you a buddy of his? Search and look, for out of Galilee, Galilee riseth no prophet. And every man went unto his own house. In other words, they all went off in their own directions, right? So the Day of Atonement was the only day out of the entire year when the high priest would go behind the veil into the Holy of Holies with the blood of the sacrifice and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. Now remember I said Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, Day of the Lord, they're all, so they're, they're all uh, uh, can you get this picture, Mike? Because we know it's going to be on there somewhere. What am I doing here? Uh, they're synonymous terms. In other words, they all, they all mean basically the same thing, right? So this, this offering, the day of the Lord, the day of atonement. This offering of the innocent substitutionary sacrifice made possible the atonement for the sins of the nation. Right? The word atonement means to cover. All right, let's look at this then. Leviticus chapter 16, verses 6 through 10. Suzanne, Leviticus 16, 6 through 10. And Aaron shall offer his bullock. Now remember, Aaron was the high priest. All the Levitical priesthood. And so Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And make an atonement for himself and for his house. Now get this. This is the high priest that's offering up the sacrifices for all of Israel. But before he can offer up the sacrifice for Israel, he has to offer one up for himself because he's a, he's a loser too. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's just like us. Right? It's not, if, I'm, if we're still under the law, I want to offer up a sacrifice for you, but my sacrifice is, isn't, is irrelevant unless my sins have been dealt with. Exactly. So I've got to get my act together first before I can do anything for you. That's the, that's yeah. the logic behind this, okay? So Aaron has to offer up a sacrifice for himself before he can offer for the children of Israel. And then, then after he's done that, he'll take two the two goats, and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. <coughs> Excuse me. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Praise the Lord. Uh, let's go to verse 15. S stay in the same chapter here, but verse 15. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people. 
So the one, not the scapegoat, but the other goat is the one that he's going to kill. And then he'll bring the blood within the veil or behind the veil to where the mercy seat is, where the presence of God is represented. Amen. And do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. All right. Verse uh, 20 and 20, 20 through 22. When he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Okay, so he's killed the one goat and sprinkled the blood, right? Now he brings the live goat, the scapegoat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel. And I'll just say this, it's just like with the lamb. He, he's, not, he's not looking at the people no. whose sins are going to be covered by this goat, right? He's looking at the goat. They're inspecting these animals to make sure that they are pure, that they're clean, that they don't have any blemishes, that they're not scarred or crippled or anything else, right? So their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. That hand of a fit man translates actually a priest is who, he, who takes it out. So the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities into a land not inhabited, and he shall let the goat, he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Okay, so Jesus fulfilled the spiritual, all of the spiritual aspects of the Day of Atonement, or the Day of the Lord, uh -huh. of the Lord. Unlike Aaron, Jesus didn't need an offering for atonement for himself. He was without sin. Right. The offering that he took was strictly for us. It had nothing, yes. the offering that he brought, his own body, amen, his blood, was for the sins of the world. He had none, so he didn't need an offering for himself. It made him the great high priest, right? So he went into the heavenly. He's our great high priest. Scripture tells us he is. So he went into the heavenly holy of holies with his own blood that was shed for our sins and the sins of the entire world. Now, believers, you and I as believers have been forgiven and made clean once and for all by the blood of Messiah Jesus. Amen. His blood did what the blood of bulls and goats could never do. Exactly. Amen. Exactly. It didn't just cover our sin. It took them away never to be remembered again. Amen. As far as the east is from the west, I will remember your iniquities and your sins no more. Amen. We're not trying to get on the good side of God. We've already been declared righteous. We've already been accepted by the Lord. God loves you no matter how much you screw up. We don't want to screw up, but we do screw up. And God's uh, opinion of us never changes because of this once and for all sacrifice. Amen. His blood didn't just cover. It took him away. Amen. That is the finished work of redemption and salvation regarding our position with God. We are good with God. And God is good with us. And that will not change. It cannot change. Because it's not based on you. You didn't get into this because of you. You can't get out of this because of you. In other words, you didn't get saved because of what you did. You got saved because of what he did. So how are you going to get unsaved? Right. Yeah. Exactly. You can't do enough junk to get unsaved. All you'll do is create a bunch of issues that you've got to deal with. God's already dealt with them, right? But you've got this horizontal stuff to mess with, you know? Okay, so here I want to, I want to give... I've got a, a lot of books about, I don't know, four or five bookshelves, ceiling to floor to ceiling. And a lot of it is Jewish teaching, uh, rabbinic teaching, only because you can learn. This is the people that Jesus was talking to, that he was dealing with when he was here, right? So I'll just, I'm going to just give you three examples here. Eidersheim, Hillel, who it's believed was the rabbi that Paul was taught by, or was, was raised under, uh, uh, Hillel and then Weissel, W-E-I-S-E-L. They're all rabbinic writers. And uh, with the exception of Eidersheim, they're all ancient writers. Eidersheim was, is current, re relatively contemporary, I mean, within the last 75 years or so. But here's what they say, all of them in agreement, and others as well, I'm just picking out these three. The high priest, this thing that we've just read here, the high priest would take a crimson thread and he would tie it around the horns of the goat. 
the scapegoat, right? Not the one that they killed, but the one that they're going to lead out into the wilderness. He tied this around the, and, and sent him off into the wilderness accompanied by a priest. They even, are, they even say specifically they would go 12 miles. So they had a, a specified destination that they were going to, 12 being the number of tribes of Israel. So they would take this one priest would then lead this scapegoat 12 miles out into the wilderness to a designated place where the priest would push the goat bearing Israel's sins over a cliff. Praise the Lord. A portion of that crimson thread that he tied around the, the goat's horns was attached to the door of the temple before the goat was sent out into the wilderness. So they had this one crimson thread or ribbon. They would tie part of it around the goat. The other part they tie on the doorknobs or the door handles of the uh, temple. So when the goat was pushed off the cliff and died, the thread on the door of the temple was said to turn from red to white. Now this is rabbinic teaching. This is historic teaching by these ancient rabbis. One of them that was Paul's teacher. So when this goat was killed, when he was pushed over the side, they claimed that the, red, the crimson thread on the door of the temple would turn white. Now, that was a divine sign to the people that God accepted their sacrifice and that their sins were, uh, were covered or forgiven for another year, right? All right, look at Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, right? The goats shall bear up. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool, all right? In the rabbinic writings, they tell us that for 40 years, now this is, this is factual writing. This is not just somebody's dream, you know, 5,000 years later or 3,000 years later. This is what they were writing at the time. The rabbinic writings tell us that for 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple, the thread stopped turning white. It, that was one sign. The thread remained red. This is 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple, which was in 70 AD, when Rome burned it to the ground and left no stone on top of another stone. So it's exactly the time when Jesus was here on earth, yes. when he was yes. being crucified. It would have been wow. around 30 AD or thereabouts, right? So they tell us that the thread stopped turning white. Now, these are not Christians. These are not people promoting Christianity. These are Hebrews. Yes. They're dealing with their own reality okay here's what they said there were other signs as well at the same time the westernmost light and the temple menorah wouldn't burn remember I talked about the you know the menorah last week and the representation of Christ and so on and so forth anyway the westernmost out of seven there's seven in a menorah in the uh, traditional menorah there are seven candles one in the center three on either side. The westernmost one would not light. These are just running by wicks and oil. But it wouldn't burn. No matter what they did, they couldn't get it to burn. So that westernmost candle in the menorah would not burn. That's a bad omen, right? Yeah. And the reason, the light, because that the light of the temple was going to be extinguished. That's what they believed was coming. In other words, the revelation that the temple was supposed to bring, the light that was supposed to, the candelabra, the, the menorah is what gave them light to minister in the holy place before they go into the holy of holies. It's where the altar of incense was. It's where the, uh, uh, the showbread and, and the, the, the lab. And so he's saying, if you lose the light, you can't minister. If you, don't have, if you can't see what you're doing, you can't do what it is you're supposed to be doing. All right? So, all right, that's a bad deal. Then the other thing was the temple doors began to open on their own. Now, they had designated priests that did all of this stuff. But all of a sudden, they, they recorded this, that the doors started opening on, all, automatically without anybody being there, right? And the rabbis saw this as a sign that the temple was going to be destroyed by fire 
as God's judgment. Forty years before it happened, at the time that Jesus was crucified, they weren't making the connection they should have been making, right? Because they didn't have the Spirit. They're steeped in this religion. They're just saying, for some reason, we believe God's sending us a message that He's going to destroy this temple. All right? Look, and the reason they believe that, look at Zechariah 11 and 1. Again, based on the rabbinic writings, this is how they, this is how they read the Torah. This is how they read the Scripture. So this, they believe, came from Zechariah 11, 1, which says, Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. Trees are representative of humans. It's throughout the, the Scripture. And Lebanon being Israel. So open thy doors, Israel, so that the fire can devour. That's where they got the impression that all these things that were happening were omens pointing to what God was going to do. So here's the obvious significance of all this is they began to appear 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple, as I said. That was when Jesus was crucified. All right? It was a dramatic way for God to demonstrate that Jesus was the ultimate reality of the Day of Atonement. Once you had His Day of Atonement, the rest of it's a waste of time. Any more killing of animals, any more dragging blood into the, all, into the holy place, any more sprinkling is a waste of energy because it's already finished. You don't need the temple anymore. The God of the temple has shown up in flesh. He rent the veil, amen, that separated the humanity from God. Our high priest went in once and for all and gave us access now to the Father, to Abba, right? So, His death and His death alone provided the once and for all forgiveness for sins. Zechariah was speaking of the future literal fulfillment of the Day of Atonement. Look at this, Zechariah 12. I know I'm going slow here, but I don't want to put information out here that won't do you any good. Zechariah 12, verses 10 through 14. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. This is the ultimate day of atonement. And Zechariah is prophesying this, as well as the destruction of the temple. He later then brings this up. I'll pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadadrum and the valley of Megiddo. 13? Oh, I'm sorry. And the land shall mourn every family apart the family of the house of David apart and their wives apart the family of the house of Nathan apart and their wives apart in other words everybody individually this is no longer male female you know what I'm saying everybody's going to have the same issue all right Zechariah 13 uh, verses 1 and 2 the family of Levi he's just going on with the same thought there so Zechariah 13 verses 1 and 2 So in that day there shall be a fountain opened in the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. Remember Jesus said, if uh, come to me all you that thir are thirsty and, uh, and I'll give you drink. And out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. In other words, out of you will go a continuous cleansing and washing. Amen. And it shall come to pass that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cut, cause the prophets and the unclean spirits to pass out of the land. Yes. Praise the Lord. Good news. Amen. Praise the Lord. So now we could go back to Leviticus and talk about the Aaronic priesthood, talk about sin offerings, free will offerings, incense offerings, uh, and all the garments of the priests. But the bottom line is this is every bit of ancient Hebrew worship is just another picture of the priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. He is not only the offering, but the one who does the offering. Amen. All through the Bible, Jesus is depicted, all right? So let's look at this now. Revelation 1, verse 1. The 
revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things that which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. All right? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen to what I'm saying. This is the progressive culmination of the 66 books of the Bible. The reason, one of the reasons I'm teaching on this this morning is because over the last few weeks, I've seen all these different ministries talking about the end times and the book of Revelation. And it's all spook and freak and nervous. And you look out, here it comes, and you don't know what's going to happen, and everybody's got their own interpretation, and so on and so forth. But I'm saying the book of Revelation is simply the culmination of the whole Bible. So you got 65 books prior to this. This is the 66th book in the scriptures. And it's the fulfillment or the culmination of everything prior to it. Yes. All right? And notice, it's not the book of revelations, plural. There's just one revelation going on here. Yes. And it's Jesus. Yes. Amen? And if it's true of the book of Revelation, then it's true of the entire Bible, because if you believe the way I believe, the book of Revelation is simply the culmination of all the rest of the Scriptures. In other words, it just comes condensed here in the book of Revelation. All right? So maybe that's the reason why it's the last book in the Bible. You suppose? Praise the Lord. I don't want to be, I'm not trying to be condescending, I'm just stupid. So... Because it's the last book of the Bible, when we get to this part of the scripture, we can crack the code and realize that Revelation isn't just talking about literal things, but about deeply spiritual things. Yes. Otherwise, we approach the book of Revelation the way the Hebrews approached the other, the Torah. Yes, and we get nothing out of it except confusion. Exactly. All right? You don't need a degree in theology to interpret the book of Revelation. You don't need the USA Today. You don't need CNN. You don't need Fox News. You don't need to twist it and make it fit one specific or strategic time or a particular season in human history. This revelation of Jesus Christ is relevant to every believer in God who has ever lived or who ever will live. Throughout time, from the time of its writing. Amen? In any age, from the time that Jesus physically walked on this earth to this very moment. It's been relevant for every generation. See, now I'm going to just use a big word here for a moment. Hermeneutics. It's not, you know, the neutering of Hermon. They are principles, hermeneutic principles they're called. And they teach you that you have to stay consistent, amen, with certain principles of interpretation. When you're dealing with the Bible, it's taught in Bible school, Bible college, theology, and so forth. But here's the deal. Actually, hermeneutics are just simply the science of interpreting literature. You would learn it in an English class, a writing class. I mean, it's not just a law that applies to the Bible, but it applies to any kind of literature. And that law is that, however, you have to stay consistent with your interpretation of it. You can't, you know, do one thing and then jump to another, which is what we have done with denominations, because we have already got some preset ideas and preconceived ideas. Now we've got to squeeze everything into this belief to make it fit. That's not hermeneutically correct. It's not the way you're supposed to translate literature of any kind, certainly not the Bible. So if you're going to use one set of rules to interpret scriptures, listen to me, then you have to stay consistent with those rules throughout. Yes. You don't get to change the rules when you change books. Right. I mean, when you, it's, got to stay, it's got to remain the same. They've got to be consistent. Amen? So let me just get, for comparison's sake, let me just give you this. Look at the, probably the most simple or the simplest of symbolisms in the scripture. And it is, there's this furry little creature mentioned over and over. A lamb. Mm -hmm. A little lamb, right? Look at Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6. I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, 
having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Okay, so it doesn't take a rocket scientist or a lot of spiritual discernment to see that this lamb is a symbol. Right. It's not literal. Right? right? First Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verses 12 and 13. Now I know I'm, I'm just kind of droning on here, but this will help you. It will help you understand why it is we get off on all these little rabbit trails and these denominational things and, and we, get, we scare ourselves with stuff that we shouldn't be afraid of. Exactly. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world. This is talking about believers, right? We haven't received the spirit of the world. We don't have the same spirit of, of the enemy, the devil, fear, right? We've been delivered from that. We don't have the spirit, but we have the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Mm -hmm. Which things also we speak. Not in the words which man's wisdom or intellect teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. All right? So you don't have to be brilliant. You don't have to have a you know, 180 IQ to discern this lamb is not referring to a literal barnyard creature running around somewhere on a farm. Right? right? This lamb is a picture of Christ. We all believe. I mean, we don't have a problem with that, right? It's obvious, right? It's a code word. Praise the Lord. It's a key. Yes. It's a symbol. It's a metaphor that's telling us that if we will compare spiritual things with spiritual things, we'll immediately know that this slain lamb signifies, as he said in 1.1, 1, 1, God signifying, amen. It signifies the Lord Jesus Christ. It signifies or it identifies Christ yes. whenever you see it. Right? John 1, 29. Jesus comes to the, to the shores of Galilee. John the Baptist is there. What does John the Baptist say? Yeah. The next day, Jesus, John sees Jesus coming and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So if this Lamb that John the Baptist is seeing, is referring to here, is a spiritual symbol, and we know that it must be, then it only makes sense that we remain consistent with our hermeneutical guidelines. Yes. That when you see the Lamb, somehow it's talking about Jesus. Somehow yes. it's making a reference yes. to Christ. Yes. So realize, the Lamb that we see in Revelation is not a literal barnyard animal either. <laughs> Duh, right? Yes. So you think, okay, come on, you're wearing me out with this. I know, but, but follow me here, because if this is correct, then the temple in Revelation isn't referring yes. to some future building, no. amen, in Israel. No. That's right. it, in fact, it's not going to be made with hands. No. No. Because the temple in Revelation is the same one that the New Testament speaks of in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. Yep. Can you see how it kind of simplifies things when we quit trying to mix metaphors, when we quit trying to make literal things out of spiritual things and spiritual things out of literal things. So what? Know ye not your body yes. is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you which you have of God. You are not your own. Right. Here's the real deal. Yeah. I'm going to speak to you spiritual to spiritual and he says your body's the temple. Not that thing in Israel. Not some building somewhere. Exactly. You are the temple. That was a type that pointed us to something God was trying to show us. Amen? Yes. You didn't have the Spirit, so you had to have a temple. Yes. Amen? You get the Spirit, you are the temple. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right, now look a little further here. 2 Corinthians now, chapter 6 and verse 16. See, we're living, I don't, I'm not questioning we're living in the last days. I'm just saying the last days will be whenever people get a revelation and step up. Yes. Jesus is going to be revealed. Yes. God is going to come. There's a, there is an ultimate day of atonement, and that's what I'm really trying to get to here in my weird little way. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Praise the Lord. So then, maybe the other pictures in Revelation, the golden candlestick, the altars of incense, the brazen lavers, the brazen seas, the throne room, 
They're not just pretty pieces of furniture on some planet called heaven out in Never Never Land. Right. Amen. I'm just saying that the symbols, amen, of Revelation aren't found in USA Today. It's not found in today's newspapers. You're not going to get it by some person from the world trying to give you some interpretation that fits their paradigm in the age that we happen to be living in because of this or the, or the other thing. Amen. So it, it, you don't get it from television news. No. You get it from Scripture. Yes. Praise yes. the Lord. We just need to know that if we'll read the other 65 books of the Bible... You can uncover the symbols that are in Revelation simply by understanding the symbols and metaphors and types that are in the rest of the Bible. Because he's not telling us a new thing. He's just bringing to completion or fulfillment everything in the other 65 books. So as God is moving from the Old Covenant into the New Covenant, that's when Jesus came to the earth. God's making this shift. He's moving from the Old Law, from the Old World, from the Covenant of Law to the covenant of grace. He's making this shift. He's trying to help us to make that change, right? I'm talking about humanity. So, so he's, God has moved. Jesus, when, not, when not, this is actually taking place, the disciples take Jesus to, the, to Herod's temple to see all these beautiful buildings and all the stonework and the majesty and so on and so forth. And so Jesus looks at this building and here's the observation that he makes which I think is fascinating. John chapter 2 and verse 19. He's seen all these beautiful buildings of the temple. And then he says, see this? But he doesn't point at himself. He just says, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. And being as unspiritual as they were, they all said, it took our fathers, you know, 500 years to finish this temple. And he's going to tear it down and build it in three days? See, they were totally separate, disconnected from the spirit side of this thing. So look at Mark chapter 14 and verse 58. And here's what the disciples had heard him say it. They heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. And within three days, I will build another made without hands. Praise the Lord. Amen. So within three days, I'll build one that is built without hands. Yes. Uh -huh. Now go a little bit further with this. Because we have our idea then, okay, well, from the time of his crucifixion to the resurrection, three days, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, but look, what about the house that God is building today? See, you are the temple of God, I am the temple of God, but corporately the body of Christ, all the born-again people that will live are the church, are the yes. body of Christ. Yes. So although we have this reality, there is something else that's ongoing, which is a, uh, a building that's under construction and has been for two days. Yes. 2 Peter 3 and 8. Yes. I'm complete in him, but the building isn't complete because everybody that's going to be saved is not saved. Right? right? Yes. So, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. A day with the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. So we know it's been two thousand years. Yes. So we are on the dawn of the third day. Yes. Amen? It's been under construction for two days. Yes. So it suggests that the temple, God's spiritual house, yes. has been in ruin or not completed for two days or for 2,000 years. We are right now living in the dawn of the third day. Yes, 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 yes. Praise the Lord. God isn't going to just raise up a physical body. He's going to raise us up yes. as the body of Christ yes. and the temple of God. And when it's finished, God will manifest in the latter house more gloriously than ever before in the former house. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. The old covenant temple Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 3 and 10 through 17. Yes. Old, this, the old covenant temple was a building that God operated out of, mm -hmm. right? To, to, to give forgiveness, to give yes. redemption and mercy and healing. And that's the way you had to go there. That's, that was the place to go. And did all eat the same spiritual meat? Did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. 
But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should lust, should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. 1 Corinthians 3, oh, sorry. 10 through 17. Sorry. Those were great scriptures, though. <laughs> Praise the Lord. They really are. <laughs> According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. This is Paul talking. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Yeah. All right? Now, if any man build upon this foundation, Jesus is the foundation of this temple. Yes. Yes. Right? This is the temple of God, but he is the foundation. Yeah. So, And he dwells within this temple as well. Yes. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. So the temple's going to be still standing. Why? Because Jesus suffered the consequence. I'm, it will be revealed by fire, but stay, just stay with me. Because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Praise the Lord. Jewels and precious stones were fine for the Old Covenant. Amen? But they are wood, hay, and stubble compared to our reality. Yes. Yes. Amen? God doesn't dwell in buildings made with hands. He's already told us that multiple times, right? God lives in houses made of lively stones or living stones is, is how that interprets. Amen? God lives in living buildings. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen? Fitly framed together, the scripture says, to be a habitation of God through the Spirit. Yes. Not the flesh, not the intellect, through the Spirit. Amen. God allowed Rome to destroy the physical temple in 70 A.D. Amen? Forty years after the crucifixion of Christ. And he did it because God was transitioning to a more expansive spiritual temple... You and me. Yeah. Praise yes. the Lord. And we let people twist us and yank us around thinking we got to wait for another building to be built in Israel before Jesus is coming. No. I'm telling you what the scripture says. Yes. You are that temple. Yes. Yes. And Jesus will appear yes. in his temple yes. when we recognize yes. Yes. his presence. Yes. He appears in us, in us. and through us. Praise the Lord. Amen. I know I'm messing with theology here, but I'm just saying. So let's just take it a little further. God speaks and works primarily from his temple. Right? We talked about that. Yes. If you were sick, even when Jesus healed people, he had to send them to the temple. The priest had to declare that person healed. Right. He had to look at him and say, okay, no more leprosy. Yes. Yes. If you needed a sacrifice, if you had sinned, you had to go to the temple you had to buy a lamb. You had to bring a goat. You had to bring something there to sacrifice. And the priest would then do it. Ultimately, then he would go to the presence of God within the Holy of Holies and offer the sacrifice. Yes. Right? All right. So let's just go further. If God speaks and works primarily from his temple, not some marble, jewel-studded building somewhere, he speaks and acts through you and me. God appears... God is revealed through us. Amen. <laughs> Praise yes. the Lord. I know, it's hard to figure, but that's just the way it is. See, that's, that's the significance to me, the signifying, if you will, of Revelation is that, look, as flawed as we see ourselves as being, God says we are fitly framed, a beautiful building. Yeah. Amen. Jeweled. Right? Fantastic. And I'll work from you. Yes. But because of all the religious teachings, we're always modifying that. We're always con you know, dumbing it down to where God can only work in me when I am pristine and perfectly holy. Yes. Which 
Ain't going to happen. It just won't. But God has declared me holy, pristine, without sin. We say we believe it, but if we really believed it, we would literally be a revelation of Jesus. People would see that God is not angry with their lifestyle choices. Is it just, can it be destructive? Of course it can be destructive. We all know that. But God's not mad at him. God loves him. Whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, whether it's sexual you know, choices, it, God is not angry with them because of that. We got problems because of our own social issues and, 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 and hip inhibitions and all, whatever, right? And I'm not saying that those things can't cause consequences because they will. But not from God, from society, from the world that we live in, not from God. We're so afraid to love people that are messed up for fear that someone will want to judge us. Oh, come on. It's just a different thing. Their thing and my thing, they come short of the glory of God. But it's just a thing. I mean, come on, either we believe this or we're just wasting time here. Because if it's about us, look, some of y'all may be a little better in this area and not so good in this area. It doesn't matter. We're all coming short. Without Christ, we all are losers. And because of that, we can take this message to anybody in any circumstance, in any situation, in any lifestyle, with whatever choices they made, we can still say, God loves you unequivocally. He will not turn his back on you. He will not discard you. He will not give up on you. All of your sins and iniquities he has forgiven and cast away and never to remember them again if you will just believe. And what's the obstacle that they have to believe? My problem, my choice, my behavior. See, it's not God's problem. It's our problem. And it's our problem because we have believed religion has declared us to be the author and finisher of our faith when it's God and Him only. Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. So if this lamb, this furry little animal, is a spiritual icon, a symbol, then don't you suppose the rest of the book of Revelation, again, staying consistent with hermeneutical teaching and rules, the rest of the book of Revelation is not about monsters coming up out of the ocean, flying giant bugs <laughs> the size of Volkswagens, right? Maybe the beast rising up out of the sea is a spiritual symbol. Yes. Seas always, look for yourself, they always are symbolic of peoples. Yes. The beast, and I've taught on this before and I may do it again just for the fun of it, amen. The beast is the old nature. It's the human nature. Yes. Amen. Are they not like beasts? Yes. You know, the natural man is a beast. Yes. He's not connected with God. He's not spiritual. Amen. So this beast that we think of is going to be some, you know, horrid, ogreous, you know, hideous looking, vile, giant monster is us. It's humanity. Not us that are born again, but people unsaved. Right. I mean, look around for crying out loud. Look at the yes. laws that get passed these days and the things that are tolerated and the things that are, that, that are happening in the world that we just kind of turn our head and act as though it never happened. You know, so what? It's just life. You know, that's the way it is. It's the nature. Yes. Yes. When you look at the structure of Revelation from the beginning what you end up seeing is there's a flow, a, a consistent pattern that correlates with the Feast of Israel. Wow. So, the lamb slain, Passover. Yeah. In Revelation 6 and 7, I won't go there for the sake of time this morning, but it talks about the sun, moon, stars are darkened. That's symbolic language. Yes. We're all getting up every morning and checking out the sky to see if Jesus is coming. Here, the ultimate day of atonement. Look, Acts chapter 2, verse 16 uh, and verse 21. 
Acts 2, 16 through 21. And I'll show you what I'm talking about, that this is symbolic language. It's no different than the lamb. It's no different than these other symbol uh, of pieces of furniture and so forth that we see within the temple. The feasts are the same way. They're symbolic. They're metaphors for a real truth about Christ. And we've got people that want to take Christianity back to Judaism and celebrate the feast. I mean, come on. We had people that wanted to use this church, this building, for their Passover feast. They're not Hebrews, they're Christians. If they'd have been Jews, I might have been sympathetic. But the fact that they were Christians just dumbfounded me. Yeah. Why do you want to, what do you want to have a feast when you have the reality that the feast was pointing to? Yes. Yes. The feast is Jesus. I mean, <laughs> Passover is about Jesus. It's not about eating boiled eggs, uh, you know, and... Yes. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Setting the table for Elijah. Elijah's already been here. Yes. Twice. Yes. According to Jesus, John the Baptist and the original. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God. Now, how many Pentecostals? You know, uh, you know what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. That's, this is Pentecost, yes. is what this is. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It will come to pass in the last days. In the last days, saith God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. And all my servants and all my handmaidens, I'll pour out in those days of my spirit. And they'll prophesy. And I'll show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood, fire, vapor of smoke. And, on my, and the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, my sons, my children. Yeah. Really give me a tongue twister here. <laughs> Turn into darkness, the moon into blood, therefore the great notable, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whatsoever, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The great notable day of the Lord is the ultimate at day of atonement. Yes. Right? So... Peter spoke this 2,000 years ago, and he said these things were going to happen before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, or the ultimate day of atonement. Uh -huh. He didn't say these things were coming. He said this is that. Yeah. Right? He didn't say it's coming. He said this, what you're seeing is that. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? It had been foretold. It was being fulfilled in the midst of them. And it took place at the Feast of Pentecost, which comes after Passover. All right, Genesis 37, verses 9 and 10. I know I'm really going long here, but I'll, I'll try to talk faster. But I think this is really, it, it can really be helpful. It can help us to see things spiritually so we're not constantly being manipulated by religion or Somebody who's well-meaning who just picks up a scripture here or there and throws it out and thinks that we're supposed to all just go running you know, like our hair is on fire now. So Genesis 37, 9 and 10, he said, he dreamed yet another dream. This is Joseph, right? God said, I'm going to use you, Joseph, and he gives him a couple of dreams. This is the second dream. The first one was he, he saw these uh, sheaves of wheat, and his sheep, everybody bowed down to his sheaf of wheat, right? Okay, this is the second dream, which is the same dream, just a little bit different twist. And he dreamed yet another dream and he told it to his brothers and he said behold I have dreamed a dream more or further. And behold the sun, the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me or bowed down to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren and his father rebuked him. Now this is Isaac. Amen. Or Jacob. Excuse me. This is Jacob Israel. The father of the twelve tribes. The progenitor of the 12 tribes of Israel. He had 12 sons. His name is Jacob. God renamed him Israel. So he told his father and to his brother, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to the earth? Now here's what's interesting about this. Israel is Jacob, identified by God. He understood the typologies and the significance of this dream that his kid had. Amen? You, hey, look, you have to understand. The sun, the moon, and the stars 
are not just literal bodies in the heavenlies. In Scripture, they are symbols of temporal Israel. That's the dream Joseph had. That Israel, the tribes, the people of Israel, which is what they were, they were the beginnings of this, are all going to bow down. All the stars, the moon, and the sun are going to fall before them. He's not talking about planets. Praise the Lord. He's talking about people. He's talking about temporal Israel. All right? In the scripture, they are symbols. So, the events that are unfolding in Peter's day at Pentecost were caused by God pouring out his spirit on all flesh. See, it had been all about Israel. Now he's pouring out his spirit on all, not just Israel as a nation, but on people of every ethnicity, every language, every nation. God was fulfilling his word prophesied by Joel. I'll pour out my spirit. The sun and the moon and the stars. He's talking about all these things. He's using the same language that was used in Genesis. Same language, amen, that's used in Revelation. Amen. So, Revelation 6, verse 12 through 14. I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. The stars of heaven fell in under the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of the mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. All right? So again, this passage uses some of the very same identical language that's in Joseph's dream, that's in Joel's pro uh, uh, prophecy, amen? In Revelation 7, following the opening of the sixth seal, you see God's servants being sealed in their foreheads. So just consider, we're viewing the progressive work of the Spirit of God, amen? So look at it in the light of this progression of the feasts of Israel. First we see the lamb slain shadow for us uh, the feast of Passover. Now Revelation 6 and 7, the picture of the feast of Pentecost where the angels seal God's servants in their forehead. Right? Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. So the earnest of our inheritance is a down payment that's ours by Jesus Christ. We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We've been sealed with it. That's not an ink blot on my forehead. Praise the Lord. But it's the inner working of the Spirit of God in my life. That's what it represents. The seal is God's guarantee of even greater things to come. It's a confirmation that God's presence is with me and His provision is for me. And we're looking for tattoos on foreheads and hands and praise the Lord. I'm not saying as I go on here just a little bit, I'm not saying that Israel is cast off, that God has forsaken Israel or anything else. I'm saying God turned from Israel because of their unbelief, because of their blindness. He turns to the Gentiles. All right? He's going to, he's still, Israel will be saved, but they're going to be saved the same way we're saved. The temple system's not going to save them. So them building a temple isn't going to change a thing. They still got to come to God the same way through Jesus Christ. It's just the way it is. All right? So Pentecost ushered in this mighty rushing wind, right? And it blew the fig tree. We read, I think already in the scripture where it talks about the fig tree fell, or the figs fell like they fell from the sky, you know, and so on and so forth. So this rushing mighty wind blew the fig tree, which is, a, is typifying Israel, right? So it blew this fig tree, temporal Israel, this mighty wind removed natural Israel 
and gave birth to spiritual Israel. We are Israel in the spirit. Do you see what I'm saying? It's, so the natural temple was destroyed and a spiritual house emerged. Old Jerusalem is removed. New Jerusalem comes down from heaven. The bride, the church, the lamb's wife was coming on the scene. Old heaven and old earth. Old heaven is referred to the old heaven and the old earth is the old covenant. The new heaven and the new earth is the new covenant. Because it operates by totally different laws. Right? The old heaven passed away. Old earth passed away. New heaven, new earth. Where righteousness, it says, reigns. We are the righteousness of God. We rule and reign with Him on earth. Praise God. Pentecost then is followed by the Feast of Trumpets. Revelation chapter 8, verse 2. And I really am almost done. Revelation 8, 2. I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And we sing, these are not seven angels with trumpets. They're not winged babies, uh, amen, hanging on a cloud somewhere with a little brass horn. Amen? They're a perfect picture of prophetic voices. Yes. Look at this. Every time God speaks prophetically to people, how does he do it? An angel came to Mary. An angel came to Jacob. An angel came to, to uh, you know, Joseph. An angel. Uh-huh. It's prophecy. It's prophetic voice. Yes. It's God speaking to this person. Yes. It's a prophetic voice. If you, if you go on, I'm not going to do it for the sake of time again, but Revelation 15, 17, uh, 21, it, it talks about this outpouring of these vials, seven vials, which are actually bowls of blood. Amen? Symbolizing the Day of Atonement. Not wrath. The Day of God. Jesus called it when in... in, in uh, I think it's Mark or Luke 4. Uh, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, open the sight to the blind, and blah, 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 and preach the acceptable year of the Lord. In Isaiah 61, which is what he's quoting, it talks about the day of wrath or the day of the vengeance of the Lord, which is the day of atonement when everything is judged. You're either under the blood or got the blood sprinkled or you're coming up for some bad time. Amen? So that's what he's talking about. Those, the, the, he's talking about here the Day of Atonement when he's talking about these literal bowls or vials being poured out. And we're thinking, oh my God, you know, it's the, it's the wrath. No, we're still under great. We're still living in the dispensation of grace. He's talking about the Day of Atonement. This day follows the Feast of Trumpets. We just went through the Feast of Trumpets. Amen. See, uh, Passover comes in the spring. Then Pentecost, 50 days later. Then you have the summer. Then comes the harvest. These are all harvest feasts. I, whether it's tr- Passover or Pentecost or trumpets or any. They're all, uh, they're all harvest feasts. Just different harvests. So it's basically, it's at the end of the summer then comes the, uh, the Feast of uh, Trumpets. Right? So it follows the Feast of Trumpets. What follows the Feast of Trumpets? The Day of Atonement. You've got the barley harvest, you've got the wheat harvest, you've got the grape harvest, you've got the olive harvest, and you've got the date and figs harvest. Amen? This is about the first, uh, I'm not going to say her name, but first fruits is not you sending money to me. As much as I'd like it to be because I could use the money. But that's not what first fruits is about. First fruits isn't about you letting somebody manipulate you out of your money. First fruits is about the harvest time, the end of the age, the end of the season, the end of time. I'll get to that in a minute. Look quickly, Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. God's going to reap a harvest. It's the first fruits. He's already received the first fruits. That would be us that have been saved, that have been brought in. But there's a great harvest to come. Amen. That's why this is still out there because there's the harvest isn't finished yet. We're the first fruits. Amen. We're like in the barn. 
After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. The ultimate, amen, day of atonement. And what is, so this is good news. It's a number nobody could number. It's way too many people to even come up with a number. Even with all of our computers, it's too many. It's everybody from the time immemorial, amen, into the future. And it's a good time, praise the Lord. I'd say that's a good conclusion. Yes. Amen. Doesn't end in doom and gloom and despair. But it ends in this great global harvest. Yes. More than just enough. Amen. Amen. There's more than a handful getting in. It ain't just us three and, you know, I mean, it's multitudes that no man could number. This is good news. This is good news. Praise the Lord. It's not gloom. It's not doom. It's not despair. Praise the Lord. Revelation 15, verse 3. Look what they're doing here. They're doing the same thing that Moses' sister and, uh, and they all you know, were singing when they come across the Red Sea. God rolled it back, spared them, redeemed them from the enemy, from, from Israel. And what do they do? They start singing songs. And that's exactly what this is in Revelation. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of the saints. Praise the Lord. So what it is, it's singing redemptive songs yes. in heaven. They're rejoicing. Amen. All right. Mark chapter 4, verse 26 through 32. 26 through 32. Through 32, yeah. And this is a, parala, a parable, another symbol, another type of Je that Jesus is teaching. And he said, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground, should sleep. Rise night and day, and seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. We're still talking about a harvest here, whether it's about our words or whatever, but this is a metaphor. And for the earth bringeth forth her forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Right? All right, how did it come? He said, Whereunto shall we like the kingdom of God, or with what comparison shall we compare it? It's like a grain of a mustard seed, which when it's sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that shall be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs and shooteth out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. So he says, just one little, this little tiny seed is going to produce a harvest unimaginable, uncountable, un, un, unestimable. And what is that seed? Jesus. He said, if I fall to the ground, if I be lifted up. He is the seed. He isn't just giving us a parallel here or a parable. He's saying, if I die, there's going to be a harvest that you cannot imagine. It's going to make this one man's death seem so bizarre because of the billions and billions of people that are going to be saved. And I know when the harvest is, and I know immediately when that harvest is ready, I'm going to stick in the sickle, amen, and we're going to have a harvest. And we're going to have more people that can be numbered around the throne. And they're going to be shouting redemptive songs and praising the Lord. Because God is good. He's not angry. He's not punishing. He's saving, amen, everyone that will be saved. Praise God. And let me throw this out there. There is the word kotsir. It's a Hebrew word. And it means, the root word is, it is the same word that you use for end time. And it's the same word that you use for end of the age. It's the same word that you use for end of summer. It's the word that you use for harvest. And we have been quoting and, and spewing out here, the end of the age is upon us. The end of the world is coming. No, he said, there's a harvest. We're at the point of harvest. The end of the age isn't the end of the world. Amen. It's the time of harvest. It is the end of summer. And the fall feasts are now upon us. I'm just saying, if John was in the spirit when he saw all of this, it might be a good idea for us to get into the same spirit and therefore behold the same thing. John saw from the perspective of the Lord's day, the day of atonement. He said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He saw from that perspective. 
the day of the Lord. The finished work. God's rest. God's atonement. That's what John was speaking from. That's what his reality was there. So here's the deal. Revelation isn't about the end of a time period. We need to just quit thinking that way. Revelation is about the end is a person. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. The end is not my end. The end is Jesus Christ. The author, the finisher. Amen. I am the Alpha. Revelation 1.11, he says it. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And all things that were made were made by Him and nothing was made that was not made by Him. In the beginning. Genesis. And in the end. Revelation. In the harvest. Not in the end of time. Not at the end of the world. But the end is Jesus. The same that was in the beginning. And that's what he's pointing us to. Nothing to be afraid of. He'll never leave us or forsake us. We're not looking at doom and gloom in our future. We're looking at the third day. The day of Jesus. The day when we all come to that revelation, when we all come to that understanding. New heaven, new earth. Praise the Lord. I'm not looking for planetary problems. Amen. There may be some. It has nothing to do with this. This is about Jesus. The end of one covenant, the beginning of another covenant that was all known of God from the very beginning to be fulfilled in Christ in the what we call the end. We know there is no end because there's no time in God. We're the ones that want to use time as a, as a weapon or a tool to manipulate. Have I made any sense to you this morning? Yes. Yes. We are spirit beings. Yes. We, we should operate from that spiritual reality. It causes you to rethink. It, it makes you reevaluate. Yes. See, it's exactly, look, it's, it's, it's the microcosm of what Jesus faced when he came to this planet. They had preconceived Religious ideas of what everything meant. And here the revelation of all of it is standing right before them, and they missed it completely. He said, look, if you, if you really understood the law, you would know me because that's who he was writing about. It wasn't about your rules and regulations. It was about your Savior. Praise the Lord. This book is about a loving God who has made access to him available to each and every one of us again. Not just access to come and wine to him, but access as our Heavenly Father so we can receive our inheritance, the fullness of all that God has for us. This is a good God. This is a good thing that he's doing. He didn't put us here to freak us out and to try to scare us and make us paranoid and weird at the end of the age. No, he put us here so that we can be participants in this great harvest, this last day harvest. The fulfillment of all the feasts in this great day of atonement. The day of the Lord. The harvest of God. And we get to be part of it. Can you say praise the Lord? Amen. Give him a hand. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much for your patience. I know I went really long this morning, but I didn't know how to break this thing up. So praise God. God bless you all. Go in the power of his might. Hallelujah.